Um, so, uh, you know, I have spent some time thinking about symplectic geometry, which is the geometry of some two n dimensional manifolds equipped, equipped with a symplectic form. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of amazing structure associated to such a datum. And you know, there are Gromov Whitman variants, for example, sort of counts of pseudo holomorphic curves. There are some kind of all this, all these results on Hamiltonian dynamics on such an object. And there's all this rich algebraic structure, um, like the Foucault category of the manifold. Which, by some kind of physics, is related to you know other stuff like algebra and representation theory and whatnot. And um, usually, to make sense of any of this data, any of these invariants, you have to pick some auxiliary structures. You have to pick an almost complex structure, J. And then there's some sort of preferred partial differential equation. Which is basically the nonlinear Cauchy Riemann equation for maps U, you know, from a surface to M and its various perturbations. Uh, and there's also some kind of distinguished objects. You know, we were hearing about Lagrangians and Legendrians. So, you know, the objects, the Fukaya category, for example, of Lagrangians. And, you know, this is some very rich story. It's at this point been, you know, fairly well developed. So at some point, I became sort of just curious about, uh, you know, what happens if you try to complexify every possible object of the story and, you know, see what you get. So it, maybe it's hard to complexify Hamiltonian dynamics, but a lot of the other things have interesting complexifications. I just want to say something about that. So, you know, first of all, of course, we have to complexify the underlying data. So what would we mean by that? Well, we want a four n dimensional manifold with a complex symplectic form, which means we have some preferred complex structure on my manifold. So maybe it's actually a complex manifold, which is multiplication by i. And you have like a holomorphic 2 0 form, which is non degenerate. OK, now this is a, this is a complex symplectic manifold. Like now, just like a symplectic manifold, you can't really define any invariance of it without choosing some kind of metric data. So while there's one famous way of enhancing this thing to a metric, uh, you want to pick a J, just as we did before. So that's another complex structure, maybe an almost complex structure. Once you have two of these, it's very natural to you know define I J equals K and ask for I and J to anti-commute, in which case you have a quaternionic triple of complex structures. And um, it's also kind of natural to ask for a metric for which the sort of the, so the connection of this metric preserves all of these guys, in which case you have a hyperkähler manifold. And these are sort of familiar objects in differential geometry. There's also a natural distinguished sub object in here. So, in particular, you can have a complex Lagrangian, so that's an I holomorphic submanifold. L such that omega restricted to L is zero is a complex Lagrangian. Now, okay, what can we do with this? Well, I don't know. But one thing we can do is we can produce a bunch of real symplectic manifolds out of this data. So we can take a real symplectic form omega theta to be the real part of e to the i theta capital omega. And then, of course, this complex Lagrangian is a real Lagrangian with respect to a circle of symplectic forms. So, okay, so that's some geometric object we might want to study. Well, uh, we can try to study its symplectic invariance. So, uh, let's say L0, L1 are complex Lagrangians. So uh, the, you know, a famous symplectic invariant, maybe the basic one of this pair, is something called the Lagrangian Fleur homology of these Lagrangians. And you have to choose which symplectic form. So let's say it's you know, 
any one of these turns out not to matter. Okay, what is this? What is okay? So this would be um, you know these groups turn out to be the morphisms in this category. And so this is sort of the property of the question about studying the subcategory of the Fukaya category generated by complex diffractions. Now, you know, depending on whether you are an algebraist or a differential geometer, you're going to interpret the following sort of sentence in a different way. I sort of am naturally a differential geometer. And so you know, I'm gonna say this, unfortunately, this object, is not very interesting. Which may be good or bad. You know, if something is interesting, that means you can't compute it. If something is not interesting, that means you probably can. So let me explain why this happens. So, you know, there was this talk earlier about something about Morse theory. Okay, so this is some kind of Morse theoretic invariant. I'm briefly going to remind you what Morse homology is. Um, so if you have a function f, this is a one-line summary of Morse homology. If I have a you know Morse function, non-degenerate, uh, all the critical points have non-degenerate second derivative matrix from a manifold to R, then you form some kind of chain complex. Um, so CM is direct sum of the critical points of f. And then you say D, the differential of P, is the number of flow lines, the isolated flow lines, from, say, P, to, okay, Morse homology, I'm going to do it this way, from P to Q times Q, sum over Q, with respect to the downwards gradient flow. Okay. So, so what you, can, can you say more clearly, what is DP? So this is it says it's some kind of object. No, no. Hmm? So what is the definition of DP? So you count if you, if f is generic, yes. then you count the number of isolated gradient flow lines of this function. So you know, the gamma dot. With sign. Yeah, with so there's some signs, so depending on and then you over integers, you are taking the free abelian group over integers. Yeah. Or yeah, so I can do it, sure. That's fine. And then you have to count these with sign appropriately. Or you can do it mod two, then you don't have to think about signs. OK. Is that OK? Yes. Thank you. That's more homology. This thing is supposed to be a version of more homology. So this is supposed to be um, so this is omega theta. It's supposed to be HM. So you can take the homology of this. I'm going to jump that by H. This is supposed to be HM of this functional from the space of paths between the Lagrangians. And it's just given by you take this two form, this symplectic form, and you integrate it over a path. Or rather, that's the differential of this function. This is the one form of the space of paths. Okay. So um, that, like, if you have a one form, you can define its gradient flow. So that's what this invariant is supposed to be. So in general, it's pretty interesting. So it turns out that this gradient flow <laughs> is like this equation. Now, what happens in this complex symplectic setting? Yeah. But the Morse function is not not generated on the path space, right? Uh, so if the that Lagrangians is... intersect transversely, then it is, and that's an easy calculation. Okay. So then, and in general, there's some kind of perturbation scheme we have to do. So uh, you know, when you complexify everything, so the problem is basically that um, a theta is the real part. E to the i theta times AC, where AC is some map from this path space C, which is holomorphic. So what is it? 
So again, the, again, I can't specify, it's a little hard to specify the thing itself, but DAC is just the integral of complex omega over the path. Okay. So basically we're studying the Morse homology of a real Morse function, which is the real part of a holomorphic Morse function. So, um, what is basically some holomorphic structure? Hmm? Yeah, what just by multiplication by i. You can multiply a tangent vector by i. Okay. So, complex Morse theory is boring because if you project the critical points to the complex plane and you look at the gradient flow of the real part of any one of these functions, then the gradient flows project in a straight line. So that means that if you have like finitely many critical points, if you choose a generic theta, then there's not going to be any gradient flows. So the differential vanishes. So this essentially is known to happen uh, in this kind of Lagrange and Fleur theory case. <laughs> And here I should mention people's work. There's sort of proposed, there's work by um, Joyce and Busi about what happens if they're not transverse. There's work by Rubisky Solomon about sort of analytic versions of this. They're all a bunch of interesting differential geometry. So, however, you also, I would like instead of complex Morse theory to be interesting so I can actually count something. So, at these exceptional directions, there are interesting gradient flows. So, for certain thetas, there are gradient flows. The, the actual Fleur complex doesn't depend on these because it's sort of it's independent of theta before you can perturb any one of these. But so so there's this proposal that instead to a complex Morse function, so you should assign it's sort of a category. So so this is it should assign. Is my manifold. My manifold is M. <laughs> so, where this, so the proposal is instead of trying to compute the Fleur homology of these complex Lagrangians, you should compute this sort of object, which is a category. You should have a category of morphisms between two complex Lagrangians instead of a vector space. And the category should be, uh, well, we have this complex Morse function. And if you have a, in the finite dimensional case, if you have a complex Morse function on a Kähler manifold, there's some construction, symplectic geometry called the Foucault's idle category of that Morse function, which produces a category. So you can try to do that construction in the infinite dimensional context. Okay, so now I'm going to say one thing and then result, and then maybe we'll end. Um, so, um, you know, this thing is supposed to be like the Fukai category. So it's objects you want to say are Lagrangians, but that doesn't really work because we want to do this in infinite dimensions. So maybe you want to do this with, it's hard to study Lagrangians in infinite dimensions. So instead, what this is supposed to be, this is supposed to have objects, uh, critical points, Morphisms, gradient flows, so if you have two critical points and like straight line gradient flows, it's sort of the morphisms, and then the composition is given by solutions to the complex gradient equation, which is like ds u plus j dt u equals grad real part e to the i theta w. Um, with respect to certain asymptotics. So you're supposed to take several morphisms and compose them by solving a PDE on the plane to your target manifold with these sorts of boundary conditions. Uh, if you do this in this case, you get some interesting story. So here you get the objects are L0 cap L1, the morphisms are uh, polymorphic strips, the ones that kind of we couldn't count before because they would disappear under perturbation. And the composition is given by solutions to this kind of equation. Uh, zero, one, cross R2, 
uh, these have coordinates tau s and t, and it's i d tau u plus j d s u plus k d t u. So if you do this, this sort of conjecture, and I spent some time thinking about this conjecture and making some slow progress on it, is that there should be a two category. I will end after this. What x or what m, which decategorifies upon taking Hochschild homology of every pod category to the Fukayak category, which is nominally boring. And so that's the way to count these interesting polymorphic strings in an algebraic degree. So I could say a lot more about it. So here, you did not need the hypercalorie structure so far. I needed that to write down that equation. Yeah, yeah. But so the whole story is about, you know, if you have a hypercalorie manifold, the natural PDE to study on it isn't this one, it's that one. So no, you kind of get a higher dimensional. But this consideration could have been done on just with the complex symplectic manifold. Um, well, I wouldn't know how to define any of this object or no, kind right. of this object. Yeah. But this just is <laughs> complex. Yeah. But you would also start choosing a J because I is not compatible with it. So you choose a J anyway. <laughs> There's some heuristics about this that come from physics. Yes. So this, so there's some story. Um, so physics. Okay, I'll say something about physics. There is some kind of 3D n equals four sigma model. This has an A twist and a B twist, just like. The sort of 2D, 2's whatever sigma model, the one that gives rise to 2D mirror symmetry. The A twist should gives you a 3D, both of these give you TQFTs. The A side TQFT assigns its two category boundary conditions to X. The B side is this thing called the Kapustin Rosansky Salinas category, which has been, it's because it's algebraic, it's sort of a little better study, but it also has a variable of some mirror X check. Um, yeah, uh, you know, if you think if you decategorize, so because these x's and x checks are interesting varieties, if you apply Hochschild homology, you recover interesting representation theoretic stories. So, like, you know, if you take x equals t star g mod b, and you recover things related to representation theory, so these things are supposed to categorify those stories. Um, yeah. But yes. Um, in that, say so the J, which of those complex structures is compatible? Like, is there some sort of compatibility with just? Yeah, J is compatible with um, like the real part of omega, and K is compatible with the imaginary part of omega up to sine. Yeah. The main thing that's interesting for me is that there's this algebra and sort of story, but actually this PDE is pretty understudied. And it's fun to study it, but in the, with all the algebra in the back of your head, because then you start finding problems which are relatively easy, um, but interesting algebraically. So I don't know. I could say one more thing if anyone, but I'm not sure. We're not assuming it to be compact, right? Um, so the only context, so there is no, there are no computations of this thing. There's no real definition. Um, what I can say, and I, you know, I did some work to this regard. Okay, I do something. No, I can't. Let me write something here. So if you take x is a, a, a sort of an affine variety, just as in symplectic geometry, the easiest kind of objects to study are cotangent bundles of things on the lower level down. So cotangent bundles of Riemannian manifolds are the easiest symplectic manifolds. Cotangent bundles of Kähler manifolds are the easiest hyper, hyper kind of complex symplectic manifolds. Um, so if you take in this two category, um, if you take the zero section and the graph of the differential of a holomorphic function, then this should be equal to this conjecture to the Foucault-Sinal category of the function on the base. 
And um, the thing that I sort of thought about is uh, this should be proven by just identifying moduli spaces on both sides. And you can more or less do that. It's an adiabatic limit statement. And, you know, you take this function to be small, and then these solutions to this equation degenerate to solutions to this equation. So there's actually sort of a bijection between these two things in cotangent levels. So that's a non compact example. This has to be non compact. So this PD has a lot of rich differential geometry, which, because of this category theory, sort of remains to be discovered. But the hyperkähler structure here. So there is no hyper, so uh, there is no hyperkähler structure on a cotangent bundle. But to formulate this PD, all you need is an i, j, and a k. So you can pick a, a, a quaternionic triple on a cotangent bundle. Then you need to control the energy, some kind of energy of these things, and that you can do. So you, you start working with kind of almost hyperkähler structures. So, you know, symplectic geometry is kind of like, is usually done by choosing a symplectic form in a J. So it's kind of like almost Kähler geometry, right? So similarly, there's some sort of world of almost hyperkähler geometry, which has more examples than these sort of very, very rare kind of hyperkähler things. Yeah. All right.